Hi everyone, welcome to the Jenkins online meetup. Today we have a presentation about uh, uh, moving from local installations to scalable Jenkins and Kubernetes. We will talk about the uh, Kubernetes Jenkins iterator. Uh, thanks uh, to Mateusz and Peter for joining us. Uh, they will present Virtus Lab, one of the main contributors to the Jenkins iterator on Kubernetes. And yeah, uh, today I hope you will have an interesting uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, if you haven't used the uh, Jenkins operators uh, operator before, if you haven't used Kubernetes operators before, I believe there will be a lot of good topics uh, to study. Um, quickly about the uh, Jenkins online meetups. Uh, so Jenkins online meetups, uh, they anything about Jenkins, including Jenkins for users, Jenkins for developers, Jenkins for the community. Uh, basically, these meetups are quite informal. Uh, so we for discuss any topics, we have uh, tried to have live Kune, live demos, uh, we focus on interaction with users, we will have Kune and we will have after party, well, a kind of after party, after discussion. Um, and yeah, you're welcome to participate uh, during the presentation, after the presentation, we will again share chats where you can join and ask uh, the questions. Um, as you may have Third, we do a series of Jenkins and Kubernetes meetups. We started this session last year. We had something like six meetups uh, during um, 2020. And we continue this year with uh, this is our second meetup. Uh, there will be also a meetup about Kubesphere and Jenkins. Uh, and we will uh, be talking about Kubernetes a lot uh, during uh, CDCon and during the Contributor Summit on Jenkins 25th sorry, on June 25th, so feel free uh, to join. And um, also there is DevOps World, uh, which is coming in September 28th, 30th, um, and you're welcome to join. Uh, so deadline uh, for call for papers is actually today. Um, uh, you represent um, um, the program committee there. And if you're interested, please apply. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did uh, presentations about uh, uh, how to apply and what would be the community agenda in DevOps world. So please consider that. And yeah, shout out uh, to the sponsors uh, of the meetup. So it's Continuous Delivery Foundation, which sponsors uh, the platform, and CloudBiz, uh, which uh, sponsors uh, uh, Time for Hosts and also um, uh, Schwag, etc. So uh, let's move on. Um, and yeah, for Jenkins and Kubernetes, we always uh, look for speakers. Uh, so any experiences about Jenkins and Kubernetes relations are welcome. So how you use Jenkins and Kubernetes, how you do automation, how you uh, develop your pipelines, uh, if you develop plugins, or if you develop things like Helm charts or Jenkins separator, you're more than welcome to join and present. If you just just doing integration with Kubernetes tools, you're also welcome to join. So basically we're interested in the entire cloud native ecosystem. So you may have seen this huge diagram on the CNCF. So basically whatever there, not just Kubernetes is a subject of interest for now, us and you're welcome to present. So there is a link below, I will share a little bit in the chat. So you can just uh, submit a talk and we will be happy to host this meetup. Speaking of hosts, today we have two hosts. Uh, so it's uh, me, uh, my name is Alek Kinashev. I'm one of Jenkins uh, contributors. Uh, I work on many topics and I also organize uh, online meetups. And we also have Vahram uh, who joined uh, us today. Uh, please uh, welcome him. Would you like to do a quick introduction as a host? No. Okay, oh, that's fine. Okay, so let's uh, keep working together and yeah. Um, for Kune, uh, for Kune, we agreed that uh, the questions will be answered after the main part of the presentation. If you want to ask uh, questions, please use Zoom Kune or the chat. Uh, I can be asked to use Zoom Kune. You can see the uh, controller in the bottom. There is Kune section. Ask any question, and we will either ask answer synchronously in the chat or ask the speakers after the presentation. Uh, also, after the main part of the presentation, please uh, stay online because we will have an open uh, discussion, so we will stop the recording. So any questions you would like to ask uh, related or unrelated, you can ask them off the record uh, and we invite speakers to uh, stay as well. So yeah, it, it will be very informal uh, and you are welcome to participate in this part as well. 
after the meetup, uh, there is string separator uh, on the Virtus Lab uh, Slack. I will share the link in the chat. So you can join this channel and ask any questions about the operator there. And uh, yeah, the entire uh, contributor community is in this chat. So um, uh, there will be many people who are interested. During the meetup, please uh, keep in mind that we have uh, a code of conduct in Jenkins. This code of conduct is very simple. Please be nice. And uh, yeah, uh, there is more text here, but uh, yeah, it's uh, quite short. So I won't stop much on that. And yeah, please uh, welcome Mateusz and Peter. They will do the main part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you as well you. for the introduction. Thank you very much. And let me just share my screen. Okay, does it work? Can you see it? Yep. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody to our presentation about a little bit of a journey uh, from a local Jenkins installation to a Kubernetes cluster deployment. Uh, during this presentation, we would like to show you how different size organizations might deploy Jenkins and the uh, challenges they uh, might be facing on the way. But first, let's talk a little bit about ourselves. <laughs> uh, okay, so my name is Piotr Ryba. Uh, you can call me Peter. Uh, I'm a DevOps engineer at Virtus Lab, and together with me is uh, Mateusz Korus. Uh, Matt, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Yes, uh, hello everyone. My name is Mateusz Korus and uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here uh, and share the presentation with uh, all of you and as, as well as uh, Piotr as the co-presenter. So uh, we have some interesting stuff uh, prepared for you and we hope you will like it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so this presentation is split in two parts. Uh, I will be talking about the challenges with different ways of deploying Jenkins. <clears throat> and Mateusz will talk uh, about how Jenkins operator uh, can help you when using Jenkins on Kubernetes and about some plans for the future. So let's start our journey with a sample project. <laughs> uh, okay, so say hello to Alice. Uh, she has a business idea. She works on a mobile app that helps you keep a healthy diet. But to be honest, for our purposes, any project works. <laughs> uh, so she's written some code, has some tests, and she would like to integrate a CI into her repository to build, test, and upload a staging build. So naturally, she looks at Jenkins, a well-known option uh, that will get the job done. And what is more, it's free. So yeah, great. Uh, that's the app. Uh, okay, so Alice would like to keep things simple, so she decides to use Docker. Uh, she runs this command and she opened her browser. Uh, it worked. <laughs> she did some initial configuration. And yeah, basically, after setting an admin password, uh, she saw this and empty Jenkins instance. Uh, so she did some more configuration on her jobs and pipelines. Uh, for example, she might have used the Jenkins file. And then she finished her day and went to eat some pierogies. <laughs> Basically, she went home. So the next day she comes uh, to work. Uh, she boots up, boots up her computer, uh, realizes that the Jenkins is down. Uh, so she runs the same command again and opens Jenkins and more or less sees this. So again, empty Jenkins instance and the pipeline is gone. Uh, so, well, it turns out you can't rely on the same container to be always up. And you have to treat containers as short-lived and make sure your data survives uh, through container creations. So Alice does a little bit uh, of more reading on the subject and decides to change her docker run command a little bit. So there are two changes here. First of all, uh, the minus D option, uh, which will start Jenkins in detached mode. Uh, so it won't block uh, terminal window. And the second change, uh, she will mount uh, Jenkins home. So this way 
uh, her data will be safely uh, kept intact on her local file system. And to be honest, uh, you might call it good enough at this point. Uh, you might want to tweak it a little, especially if you're a fan of declarative configuration, you might transform that into a Docker Compose file and apply that. But we're not done yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Alice realizes she has a lot to do uh, in order to get her product to market and she doesn't want to miss her opportunity. So she asks uh, her friend Bob uh, to help her with the app. And at this point, it starts to become a little bit uh, problematic for them to share the same CI. Uh, they might be working from different places, uh, either, well, the same city or even around the world. Uh, and also Alice notices that uh, when jobs are run, uh, her machine slows down. So they figure out that it would be best to move their CI CD tool away from developer machines. Uh, so local installation, suddenly it's not very practical at this point. Uh, where would you move it? Well, <laughs> one option would be a thing called build machine. Uh, so basically uh, you take uh, what you've been running on your own computer and move it somewhere, somewhere, somewhere else, uh, wherever it's, it's handy. And by doing that, you can uh, allow more people to use that software since it's not tied to your computer being on and around. Uh, you may use an old PC, a mini computer like Raspberry Pi, just bear in mind that uh, Raspberry uses different architectures, so you have to use different uh, Docker images as well. Uh, but whatever that has enough power works at this point. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen this kind of deployment in their careers. Uh, it's a little bit of an improvement than we had before. Uh, and it works, especially, especially if uh, one team basically works from the same place, same room, uh, and what's more, you don't have to uh, think about uh, exposing your instance uh, anywhere outside or uh, figure out uh, any security issues. But this approach still has some flaws and uh, well, to quickly grow, go through them and not to go into too much details. Uh, well, first of all, you have to do uh, system maintenance, uh, keep your OS in good shape. Uh, you have to take care of hardware, uh, when it fails, it will fail eventually. So prepare for that. Uh, do some upgrades in case you run out of processing power. Um, some environment, environment issues uh, might happen uh, that could range from uh, broken AC and your machine overheating or to somebody uh, unplugging your uh, machine from the electrical socket. Uh, yeah, and you have to deal with IT networking and security risks. Uh, you have to figure out uh, how, or do you even have to expose it uh, outside, use a DMZ, VPN, or whatever. You have to figure that out. And lastly, it depends on the SLA of the electrical power and inter internet supplier. So in case your internet is down, uh, you might not be able to access uh, your mm, CI. Uh, another option uh, would be to use a dedicated server. Uh, so question is, uh, should Alice now spend a lot of money and order some servers and start looking for collocation options? Well, it turns out that probably not, uh, unless she wants to pivot her business. Uh, we have to remember that she just wants to build her up. So she'll probably pick something from any cloud provider. And this way she can get rid of a lot of environment problems. And she doesn't have to worry about hardware anymore. Uh, it will be kept powered, cool, uh, connect to the internet uh, by the service provider. And the hardware will also live in a restricted area. So uh, somebody stealing your hard drive uh, is much less likely at this point. But if we were to revisit our uh, drawbacks from before, so system maintenance stays, we still have to do this. Uh, hardware failures will be handled by the service provider. 
uh, you will still need to upgrade at some point in case uh, your Jenkins has to run more jobs. Uh, environment issues get cut down by a lot. Uh, still, networking, security topics. And lastly, you will suddenly not uh, really uh, depend on the SLA of the electrical power and internet supplier, uh, rather the uh, service provider, so the server itself. And yeah, so uh, if we were to identify a single point of failure at this point, uh, it will most likely, most likely be the server itself. So in case it's down, the whole CICD service is down. Uh, so the next step would be to try to address this. Uh, we'd like to run our Jenkins in some sort of a cluster. And uh, well, normally this would add another complexity of managing more servers than before because, well, we had only one and now we are thinking about several servers. So uh, it would be really nice if we got the benefits of running a cluster while being, being abstracted away uh, from the OS level. Uh, and if you even could get this as a managed service would be a huge plus uh, where all you do is say, I want to run this application or to be more precise, I want to run this container image. So let's imagine a world <laughs> where if a container fails, it gets restarted automatically. If an underlying server dies, for example, its work gets rescheduled uh, on other servers automatically. And a world where you can scale your application automatically based on used resources. So as you probably know, we live in this world. <laughs> yeah, that's Kubernetes. That's the description of it. Uh, so I think uh, we can all agree that Kubernetes gives a lot to the cloud computing world. Uh, it changes the perspective, adds a little bit of complexity, but you can't really avoid that that because uh, it abstracts away uh, the underlying OS and uh, well, soft, hardware and software. And what's more, it's available as a managed service from on the, all the major cloud public cloud providers. And now we are not really thinking about servers, but see Kubernetes cluster as, as a whole. Uh, we are no longer dealing with OS and services running processes. Uh, we're just thinking about Kubernetes resources like namespaces, pods, services, persistent volumes. So yeah. <laughs> and that's how a simple manifest file of a Jenkins deployment on the Kubernetes might look like. There are some apparent uh, problems with that though. Uh, first of all, uh, Jenkins will run in the default namespace and uh, really uh, you should, uh, well, it's advised to have a separate namespace for Jenkins uh, to do some separation of resources. Uh, secondly, and uh, probably the most important uh, aspect, uh, you won't be able to connect to the Jenkins instance because it's not exposed outside of the Kubernetes cluster. So you would have to work a little bit more on that. Uh, either use port forwarding, set up a service, configure ingress, these kind of things. And lastly, uh, it has the same flow as our initial docker run command, uh, which is um, the Jenkins home is not mounted anywhere. So uh, your data will be lost. Well, most likely it will be lost. You can get to it, but it's not easy <laughs> when default gets restarted. Uh, yeah. So, so far we've been uh, mainly focusing on availability issues. And there is more, uh, there is whole maintenance and operations aspect to that. So we have to uh, configure your uh, instance. Uh, you have to uh, find some plugins, install them, keep them in good shape. Uh, you probably want to run, run some scripts. And uh, there is a whole topic of observability and monitoring. Uh, in basically, if something bad happens, you have to uh, know where to look for issues and uh, yeah, know how to uh, address them. Uh, maybe set up a mon monitoring and alerting so you'll be the first to know that your service is down. 
and the security hardening. Uh, and I would like uh, you uh, to refer to the Jenkins documentation on that subject because it's quite extensive and that's, well, that's, that's, that's an important uh, part of documentation to read in my opinion. Uh, yeah. So I think we can all agree that using Kubernetes uh, will put us in a very great good place to begin with, uh, but there is more, more to uh, deal with. And we have to find a way to glue things together. So Kubernetes, uh, configuration and maintenance of Jenkins and security aspects, all of that. Uh, so we might ask a question, uh, what is one of the sources of our problems uh, when it comes to running Jenkins on Kubernetes? Well, it has state. Um, it's not a stateless application. So it's not like a pure mathematical function where the output depends only on the input. Uh, Jenkins has its state. So it influences, it, the, that state influences the way Jenkins behaves. And I'm sure many people have experienced at least some problems with Jenkins that are caused by this. Uh, for example, uh, one plugin update might uh, lead to a thing we call dependency hell, where you have to figure out how to update your plugins and fix their configuration in order to, for Jenkins to work. And yeah, so how can we solve this issue? So when it comes to configuration, we can use Groovy scripts. Uh, which is basically the main entry point to the Jenkins API besides REST API. And this allows us to execute uh, Groovy scripts directly on Jenkins. And uh, there are a few ways to do this. Uh, one of them is to uh, put uh, some init scripts in Jenkins home in the special directory, and they will get executed uh, on each Jenkins uh, start. And I would like to refer you to, um, there is a GitHub repository, uh, open source, uh, when, where there are some uh, very useful Groovy scripts that are just waiting for you to go and grab them. So yeah, feel free, <laughs> it's there. Uh, and as a side note, uh, yes, you can extend the Jenkins. Um, and, that's a really powerful way. Uh, you can use one of the uh, 1500 plugins uh, that are available uh, to download uh, on the site presented uh, on the slide. Uh, just you have to be careful uh, to quote, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So uh, you wouldn't want to end up in a plugin dependency hell. Uh, you have to find a balance. Uh, with the plugins you want to install. Uh, and let's mention some plugins that are worth mentioning for our case. Uh, so first of all, Kubernetes plugin. Uh, that's a great way to integrate Jenkins uh, with Kubernetes uh, in order to auto scale your Jenkins agents on demand. So you basically define a pod template um, and keep your Jenkins uh, main uh, instance running. And uh, when the job, one of the jobs needs uh, to run, uh, well, they're triggered uh, somehow, uh, a new pod will be uh, started uh, using the pod template. And after the job is done, uh, it will be cleaned and the resources will be, uh, well, received back <laughs> pretty much. Uh, yeah, uh, and another topic that will help us uh, with configuring our Jenkins, uh, well, basically those two plugins, configuration as code and the job DSL. So configuration as code, uh, let us uh, configure Jenkins uh, and its plugins using YAML files, so human readable files. And the job DSL uses a specific, well, domain specific language that lets you define uh, jobs using, again, a file. Uh, so it would look a little bit like this. Uh, so you will probably have a Git repository where you would keep all your configuration files. And by doing this, uh, you, you get 
well, versioning, uh, branches, you know, all, all those things for free, to be honest. Uh, and yeah, so we would like to have a recipe to run Jenkins uh, using job DSL and configuration as code kept somewhere and point Jenkins in that direction. Uh, so it uses that to configure itself. And there is another uh, subject that we haven't mentioned so far. So it's the uh, authentication and authorization. Uh, well, as a starting point, uh, Jenkins comes with a username and password uh, authentication, uh, which is good. Uh, it works, uh, but uh, if your organization starts to grow, you might start looking at different options. Uh, well, for example, you can use a directory service like LDAP or Active Directory, uh, or use an external identity, pro and the identity provider to set up a single sign-on. Uh, so integrate with external service using OAuth, OpenID Connect, or SAML. And uh, when it comes to authorization, uh, the built-in way is, well, enough to start with. Uh, but if you find that you need uh, fine grain access control, uh, you might want to look at the uh, matrix authorization strategy plugin, which, uh, which is really cool, can be configured uh, using a configuration as code uh, file. Okay, so a little bit of a summary. Where are we? Uh, so we came a long way from local to Kubernetes deployment. Uh, you might be hopping on the same journey at different places. Uh, you might even start with Kubernetes, uh, which will give you a lot. Uh, but I think we can all agree there are still many things to start out to have Jenkins run smoothly on Kubernetes. And it may be important to mention that we haven't touched the subject of backups. So basically anything that uh, is not uh, possible to be configured using uh, files will have to be uh, backed up somewhere and reverted. Uh, and the goal, the goal is to be able to start Jenkins in a predictable and consistent way. Uh, and that really concludes my part of the presentation. So, Mateusz, it's your turn. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation on some of the real problems that uh, people trying to uh, deploy Jenkins on Kubernetes face. And here comes uh, the Jenkins Operator project. Uh, the Jenkins Operator project uh, is all about automating the lifecycle of uh, Jenkins, which itself is an automation uh, server so you can see that it gets pretty meta but since we all here love automation i believe that uh, everyone here is excited about the possibility to have uh, a reputable and predictable uh, deployment of jenkins uh, possible to them on any cloud infrastructure really that supports kubernetes which is like <laughs> almost all of them uh, next slide please so uh, a sneak peek at the kubernetes uh, operator architecture, the Jenkins operator architecture. Uh, you can see here that within the Kubernetes cluster, there are two parts, uh, two namespaces. Uh, the first one on the left is the namespace of the operator itself that uh, works by uh, managing the life cycle of the uh, Jenkins, which uh, is run in the separate namespace on the right. The Jenkins uh, in the right in the right on the right part is just a complete deployment. Uh, it has the Jenkins master pod, uh, Jenkins agents, as well as uh, the jobs, uh, and it's fully functional uh, by itself. But all of the uh, upgrades, uh, uh, scaling, uh, all scaling is actually done by the uh, by, by the Kubernetes plugin that uh, operator uses uh, and provides to you by default. Uh, and uh, uh, besides that, there are uh, two parts, which are uh, the external storage, where you can back up your, uh, uh, your artifacts and your uh, job history, and also the uh, ingress uh, to Jenkins, uh, where you might want to set up a VPN or a Bastion host. And with Jenkins operator, it's very easy to set up an identity provider uh, 
such as uh, GitHub uh, OAuth. Uh, and all of that uh, uses, uh, all of that within the Kubernetes cluster uh, also uh, takes advantage of the airbag model, which is uh, the, uh, the model that uh, admits uh, privileges to, to certain users and group of users. It is uh, very uh, well built, it's very rigid and uh, it's great to use. And next slide, please. So with Jenkins operator, we are really uh, trying to push for uh, the configuration as code mindset, uh, because we do believe that it's great to have your configuration as code. It allows your uh, infrastructure, it, it allows your configuration to be versioned and to be uh, repeatable. Uh, it allows you to use uh, the GitOps model, which is uh, the new hot word in the, uh, in the industry. And uh, it is great for uh, debugging, for understanding the, the whole infrastructure. It's not just, uh, you know, someone some, somewhere uh, someday clicked a few uh, buttons in the UI and now nobody knows how things work. Everything is uh, clear in the code that you can see uh, in your Git repository, as well as the history of uh, how that state came to be. And next slide, please. So uh, as Piotr mentioned earlier, uh, one of the uh, greatest things about Jenkins is its extensibility by plugins. And the Jenkins uh, operator, of course, uh, allows you to uh, use plugins uh, that you want to use. Uh, here you have uh, an example of uh, a manifest. You can see that the kind is now not, not a pod with uh, just the Jenkins image, but it's kind of Jenkins, uh, which is a custom uh, resource definition provided by the operator. And you can specify as many plugins as you want. Uh, you don't have to specify the plugins that the Kubernetes uh, operator uh, uses by, uh, by itself, such as uh, JobDSL and Kubernetes plugin. Uh, they come uh, bundled with the operator. However, you can extend it however uh, much you like. And the command to apply it is just as easy as it is uh, for the uh, deployment using a pod without using a Kubernetes uh, operator. And next slide, please. So as Piotr mentioned earlier, one of the big subjects uh, for Jenkins is security. Jenkins uh, is uh, by software and software standards, uh, a pretty uh, a technology with a pretty long history. And it has some uh, legacy mechanisms uh, with it, uh, built in it that even Jenkins uh, themselves, uh, the Jenkins itself, <laughs> Uh, uh, advises users to disable, such as um, all JNLP protocols, uh, CLIs, uh, and uh, other ones. Uh, Jenkins Kubernetes, with its uh, initial configuration of Jenkins, uh, does it by default, so we don't have to even worry about it. Uh, and uh, you, will, you will have a secure uh, Jenkins deployment uh, without having to manually tweak every setting that uh, needs to be tweaked. And uh, on top of that, as I mentioned before, it uh, leverages the airbag model from Kubernetes, which is really good and uh, the like the new industry standard, really. So uh, that's, uh, that's a great thing about the operator. It, it allows you to have peace of mind without actually doing very much work uh, in the department of security. And next slide, please. So uh, the thing that Piotr mentioned uh, before also uh, is backup and restore. Uh, with our mindset, with uh, our uh, configuration as code mindset, uh, the only thing that you need to uh, uh, backup are uh, jobs history and artifacts. Because the whole uh, configuration uh, you have in your Git repository, uh, and whenever Jenkins uh, starts up, it can uh, just pull all this configuration and have all your jobs uh, ready. So uh, you can have uh, a restore script that uh, runs and pulls your, uh, pulls your jobs history and artifacts, but uh, the job definitions themselves uh, will be handled by, uh, by the operator uh, using the, uh, the job TSL plugin. And uh, next slide, please. So um, if you stick to, uh, to some of the good practices that we um, that we presented, uh, such as having, uh, you know, an ephemeral uh, state of Jenkins, uh, the repeatable deployment, basically having a recipe 
for the Jenkins that you want to get. Uh, you can use the Jenkins operator to uh, work behind the, uh, the curtain to actually um, to actually deploy the Jenkins in the state that you specify. And it handles uh, all the updates, uh, all the lifecycle that uh, needs to be handled because running Jenkins in Kubernetes is not a trivial task, but uh, with the help of the Jenkins operator, we hope to uh, help it become at least less, uh, um, less of a hustle and more of a uh, pleasant thing to do. <laughs> Next slide, please. So what's on our roadmap? Uh, that actually uh, uh, relates to a question that was asked uh, by Thomas Love uh, about uh, the new release of the Jenkins operator. We are working uh, on a new schema for the Jenkins operator, um, and it will introduce more granular uh, uh, granular elements for, uh, for uh, the components of Jenkins. Uh, so. Uh, we are migrating uh, from pod to deployment, as uh, as Tomislav, uh, as per uh, Tomislav's uh, question. Uh, we need to refactor the end-to-end -end tests, uh, and we also want to be more engaged uh, with the community. So uh, we need to establish some processes uh, within the Jenkins operator to help you um, basically work with us. And also uh, on our uh, horizon is. Uh, is your integration with uh, third party systems. And next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the biggest problem with the current version of Jenkins operator is that it only uses one custom resource, Jenkins custom resource. And we are uh, actively working on a new API that will allow uh, for it to be multiple custom resources such as Jenkins, Jenkins agents, um, seed jobs, uh, and uh, because of that, it will uh, it will unlock many possibilities for future uh, features and uh, and upgrades um, to the uh, operator itself. Uh, and also, uh, because not every element is dependent on every other element, uh, the updates will be less of a hassle. Not everything will have to restart. Uh, uh, at the same time, but it is also a very difficult subject to tackle. And you can see on the right, we have been uh, working very hard to actually figure out uh, what the dependencies between between elements are and how uh, how we need to go about uh, you know their interactions to make make it all work seamlessly and have uh, as much. Uh, uh, as much good experience to uh, to the end user as possible, and also we are actively getting involved uh, with the community uh, as of uh, this presentation, and also actively looking for feedback. You can uh, see the uh, link uh, on this slide, and uh, if you are using the Jenkins operator or if you want to try it, you can send us our feedback. It will be very much appreciated, and it will uh, help us uh, shape the future of the Jenkins operator hopefully in the right way, thanks to uh, your suggestions. Next slide, please. Uh, a big part of how uh, we are proud to be uh, uh, engaged in the community is that we have become an official sub-project of Jenkins. You can see the uh, also the link uh, on the slide uh, with the announcement on the Jenkins uh, page, and we hope to, uh, to be engaged with uh, the community and uh, hopefully have a, a very good and beneficial relationship uh, in the foreseeable future. Next slide, please. Another thing that we're doing for the community is that we are participating in the Google Summer of Code, which is, um, if you haven't heard of, uh, of it, uh, a program from Google that uh, takes some issues uh, from uh, open source projects such as uh, Jenkins or Jenkins operator uh, and issues or you know, features that need to be added. And uh, it gives uh, some uh, students opportunity to uh, work on those features. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, uh, you probably remember how difficult it is to get your first experience as a software engineer. So um, we, uh, we think that this initiative is great for, uh, for students to uh, have their first uh, 
you know, real life experience uh, and also help the open source. Uh, as a part of this project, we are implementing uh, a security validator uh, that will help uh, to for the end user to see uh, security problems uh, with the plugins that they are installed. Because, you know, if you have uh, if you have uh, some so many plugins, there are so many things that can have some uh, vulnerabilities, and it's important uh, for the for the user to be uh, at least aware of them. And uh, you can uh, read more about this. Uh, this project uh, on the link at the bottom of the slide. And next slide, please. That's the last slide. So uh, thank you very much for uh, being here, uh, everyone. Thanks, uh, Piotr, for uh, co-presenting with me. Thanks uh, to Oleg and Vahram for hosting. And um, let's see the questions uh, that we haven't answered yet. Yeah, so I hope... we are just getting started. There is a lot of questions. <laughs> There's one thing I would like to mention, and there will be some uh, t-shirts uh, as prizes uh, for the, the feedback forum. One of them, uh, one of these, basically. I'm not sure if you can see them. Jenkins operator t-shirts. So yeah. Yeah, I will uh, report uh, the link because yeah, I'm spamming everyone with links at the moment. Sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, repeating uh, the link to t-shirts is important enough, that's for sure. Yeah, so um, the first uh, matter that I touched on, but I don't feel like I've answered fully, is the Tomislav's uh, question about the new release of the operator. The, the new uh, daily release, the new like mainline uh, release, we don't have uh, an official term for it yet, uh, will be when we're finished with the new schema, when we have tested it and it's uh, good enough for... Uh, for, for you to try out uh, as well. Uh, but we have also uh, introduced uh, nightly builds, which are uh, built daily from the actual state of the repository. So any current fixes that we are implementing uh, in the old API are available through the nightly builds and you can uh, check out documentation on uh, how to take advantage of, of them. Um, okay, so next question is about uh, the using a single pod instead of deployment that's uh, what we're working on and hopefully soon it will be a deployment um okay kubernetes jenkins operator replace a jenkins server external um not sure about it what uh what's the question here? what do you mean i mean uh, a question from core training i hope i pronounce it more or less right, list. Um. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was me who clicked that. So <laughs> this question is, uh, why is Jenkins run a single pod instead of a deployment in the operator? Um, I, I just said that uh, currently, uh, well, I don't know why it's, because it's uh, it's, it's been done this way, why, uh, uh, while we're implementing the first version of the operator, but uh, we acknowledge that there are some uh, some issues, some inconveniences that uh, come with it, and we're working on uh, having Jenkins as a deployment and not just as a pod. So I hope that answers the question. Well, it doesn't answer the why, but I hope it's less relevant. Yeah, if you, know uh, that. that's, uh, if you want to proceed, uh, there is also um, GitHub issues uh, for the operator where you can raise any questions, feedback, and uh, raise feature requests if you have them. So I can share the link later. But yeah, this is the best way to actually post any requests and concerns because that's how open source works. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. And uh, yeah, another note, uh, I shared the link to the feedback form in the chat. So we would appreciate uh, your feedback so that we could uh, make our meetups uh, better. So there is feedback to organizers and also feedback to speakers. And we will appreciate all kinds of feedback and yeah, we will uh, process that uh, and uh, maybe share it with everyone. So uh, please send your feedback form because we really appreciate uh, the feedback and we really process the feedback. Yes, feedback is also uh very much appreciated all the time. It helps to shape the, uh, the, the future and see what can be improved. Um, so uh, maybe Piotr, you want to answer some questions from the Q&A? Which one? <laughs> well, your choice. I 
have you tried to run this uh, using GitOps approach uh, from Tommy's lab? I don't think we answered this one, but uh, yeah, we basically try, are trying to enforce GitOps approach <laughs> with using the operator. So that's the advised way to do this, to be honest. Um, so, uh, which questions haven't we answered yet? Because it looks like I'm a bit behind on questions. So, the question about Kubernetes Jenkins operator replace a Jenkins external service, I believe uh, we answered, right? Not. Mm. Sorry. Um. Yes, yes, I think, yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, can configurations code be used on an already running environment that didn't have the plugin before to migrate all the configuration to Kubernetes? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, of course, you can install a new plugin. Uh, well, basically, configuration as code. Uh, you can add it to your Jenkins. Uh, but I'm not sure if there is a way to uh, export your current configuration as a YAML file that will be compatible with configuration as code. Uh, and also, well, what I would advise you to do to maybe uh, try to spin up uh, a test Jenkins instance uh, with this plugin and gradually try to, uh, well, in a safe environment, uh, gradually try to uh, migrate your configuration. Uh, and, well, basically, if something goes wrong, you can always start from the scratch because you won't be touching your uh, main Jenkins instance. Yeah, well, the main thing is that you want to uh, keep a recipe on uh, how to get uh, to the desired state of Jenkins. And unfortunately, if you uh, have a Jenkins that you just clicked some options in UI, it might be a challenge to, um, to migrate it to a configuration as code. However, if you do that and you spend some, uh, some time on it, uh, we do believe that in future it will be worth and it will save you many headaches in the long run. Uh, so the okay. next question is about uh, OpenShift. So the question is from Andres. Will the creator be available on OpenShift? Uh, well, it will. <laughs> it it kind of is a little bit. Uh, but with the changes we are currently doing, uh, the, well, the, the big API schema change uh, that will be probably released without OpenShift support, but I'm not sure at this point. Uh, but the OpenShift support will be added uh, eventually. So currently, as it stands, uh, it should be working on, on OpenShift. Uh, but we are mainly focusing uh, on the new API and trying it on Kubernetes. Uh, and OpenShift uh, will come later. <laughs> Right. Uh, one thing to mention that um, actually in Jenkins we have two official operators because at some point the uh, Red Hat team started implementing uh, their own operator um, and uh, basically we ended up uh, this creating a hard fork for that. So currently if you go to the Jenkins CI uh, you can also find the uh, Jenkins automation operator. Uh, which is basically being maintained by Red Hat and uh, they have uh, implementation specifically for OpenShift. Uh, so as a user, you have a choice which project to take. You can take the Jenkins operator, you can take this Jenkins automation operator. And yeah, hopefully at some point they will still converge into a single project, but yeah, it depends on many factors. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, such option is also available. Okay, great. Okay, any other comments or more? Um, yeah, so the next question is uh, Jenkins Operator production ready like for 500 users? Mm, uh, I, 
well, I would answer this uh, maybe like this. Uh, it's as production ready as Jenkins itself. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I guess that would be a big change. So um, it's always a good idea to test this first and uh, maybe uh, gradually move your users and basically mm, test it out to see uh, if it really fits your uh, your requirements. So. Yeah, uh, but well, I don't see why it wouldn't be. <laughs> and just also, bear in mind, just bear in mind there will be some API changes. So maybe hold on with the production uh, migration just a little bit more. Uh, and about the scale of usage, uh, well, I don't know if uh, you uh, have actually 500 users working on a single project uh, and um, with Jenkins operator you can easily spin up multiple instances of Jenkins so um, you can have like one Jenkins per uh, per team or uh, however uh, you like to split it and uh, I think it will solve if you have some issues with uh, its scalability uh, I think it will help you to solve it by running just multiple instances of Jenkins. And also uh, Jenkins operator allows you to have the agents uh, being scaled uh, automatically uh, using the Kubernetes plugin. So I think it is, uh, uh, it is feasible to have 500 users uh, using Jenkins operator, but maybe not like one Jenkins operator. I would advise you to maybe consider splitting your uh, um, your workflows uh, into several several uh, smaller Jenkinses, and also that has uh, the advantage of if something actually goes wrong, it only affects like one team that actually uh, broke something instead of all of your five hundred users. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point, uh, Mateusz. Uh, well, using operator uh, makes it easy uh, to basically spin up multiple Jenkins instances, so uh, it may make your life easier but by uh, well and easier easier to scale with users so it's easier to probably uh, manage one small or few small uh, uh, smaller Jenkins instances that one done one huge Jenkins yeah yeah scale vertical scale horizontal not vertical that's our approach okay Next one is long. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Actually, I had a uh, question about the uh, production readiness and the scalability as well. So, what I know, uh, Virtuslab uh, uh, created a product, a managed service based on the Jenkins operator. So, do you have some performance metrics or other insights from uh, this product in terms of scalability, etc.? So, what's your experience there? Wow, that's a, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't have this data, uh, but uh, we can dig a little bit, maybe ask the right uh, people, and we we'll, we can get back to you later. Thank you. And um, well, if you want to quickly speak about this product, it's also perfectly fine. Or should we just uh, move for this coin? Okay, it is then. So, um, yeah, there is a long question about uh, testing uh, the operator. Uh, so, my suggestion would be to postpone this question until uh, the live QA part. Uh, so, later on the record, so that uh, we can uh, discuss it and this uh, the person who asked it uh, live. Um, and yeah, the next question is, could you please send uh, us uh, the link to the sample uh, Groovy code repository? So, okay. Uh, uh, I will, can... uh, I just have to look it up. So maybe you can go to the next question and in the meantime. Yeah, uh, thank you. So you can just uh, put it to the chat and share with all attendees. Okay. So there is another question. Uh, can I replace my actual Jenkins server uh, on a virtual machine uh, with a Jenkins operator in Kubernetes totally? Yes, with Jenkins operator, you get uh, a fully functional Jenkins alongside with some plugins that we are using for it to run smoothly within the Kubernetes. 
and uh, there's no reason why you wouldn't. Yeah, thank you. And have you ever looked uh, into integrations with QWIRT? So since we are talking about virtual machines, maybe it's something uh, what was considered? Um, I don't know anything about it. Uh, maybe Piotr? Mm, what was the question? Uh, yeah, so QWIRT um, is a project, well, one of CNCF projects uh, in uh, incubating. So basically what it does, it uses uh, Kubernetes device plugin API, and it allows uh, to provide uh, specific virtual machines uh, as uh, Kubernetes resources so that you can acquire them. For example, uh, I had an experiment when QVIRT was used to provision agent on virtual machine and share between uh, controller instances. So something like that. Uh, so I guess, yeah, the answer is no, you haven't looked in that. Uh, but yeah, generally it's a cool feature, I'd say. Yeah, yeah uh, we're certainly going to write it down and look into it uh, in the future. So thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, so yeah, I actually have seen one implementation, so maybe there will be a presentation later about that. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, moving on, um, so, uh, yeah, there is a question, I, I don't quite get it, uh, so let's return uh, to it again. So, uh, the next question is from JK, if uh, it's a single port and not a deployment, with the operator, uh, make sure it's running, uh, if a node, this uh, this port is running on uh, gold downs, for example. So basically, what is failover uh, policy for the current operator implementation? Uh, yeah, the port will get restarted. To put it shortly. <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, reminder to everyone, uh, we will appreciate your feedback in the feedback form. Uh, so yeah, I'll share the link again, um, and yeah, we will appreciate your feedback. Okay. So we still have some time. Uh, so the meetup was announced uh, for 60 minutes, but we, we can continue a bit, I, I think. Is it fine with everyone? It's cool for me. With me. Okay, so let's uh, continue a bit. And yeah, if you have to drop at this point, thank you. And we will publish the recording uh, later today. Um, so, yeah. So uh, the next question is about uh, nodes. So can uh, one at custom Jenkins nodes, uh, for example, nodes which are not containers? I guess it's a bit aligned with what I said about Kubevirt. Uh, but yeah, what's your opinion on that? Uh, uh, currently? Uh, I don't think you can, uh, but it's something that we, we could uh, think about uh, at some point in the future. Uh, well, the problem is that uh, uh, the agents are contacting Jenkins uh, currently uh, through two uh, Kubernetes services and these services uh, may not be exposed uh, outside. So as it stands, uh, it won't allow you to connect your agent from the outside, so. Yeah, yeah. actually um, in Jenkins, there are two types of agents. There are inbound agents and outbound agents. So inbound is those ones which initiate connection on their own, for example, classic general P agents, though they don't really use general P as a standard um, and a few other types of agents like Kubernetes agent. But at the same time, uh, there are also outbound agents. So for example, uh, SSH built agents, VMI uh, agents and other plugins. For example, CC2 plugin allows to connect the agents in inbound mode over open SSH. So for these agents, you can actually use um, a Jenkins operator because uh, whatever only thing we need is to put configuration for this agent in the configuration is called YAML. And once you put it there, when your agent starts up, these agents will be connected and then Jenkins will manage them as outbound. 
but the yeah, agent, uh, in this case, Jenkins will be connecting to them. So even if they're not within containers, but yeah, it doesn't cover all use cases for agents and Jenkins. It's still quite, yeah. quite handy. Yeah, but uh, mm -hmm. in terms of operator, there may be a manual workaround possible. Uh, so you can try to do this and look it up. It, it may be possible to do this. It's just not uh, supported by the operator by default. So there may be some manual work involved there. Maybe another example for the feature request. And yeah, for outbound engine, so there are some examples in the Jenkins file runner documentation uh, and in the Jenkins configuration as code plugin documentation. So basically all these cases can be reused in the Jenkins operator. So of course you wouldn't be running Jenkins file runner, but yeah, the same configuration can be used uh, and if the plugin is present, uh, you will be able to connect an external agent. Moving on then, and yeah, thanks. Um, so another one, I, I believe you answered that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, question from Andy, does uh, the operator include actions like requesting storage from your cloud provider to create the volume from API? Um, and yeah, if so, uh, how uh, is it restricted to certain cloud, cloud providers? Mm, that's something that's supported natively by the. We are basically just making uh, persistent volume claims. So there is, uh, so there is this handled by Kubernetes. We are just interacting with the Kubernetes API to make those claims and uh, the underlying, uh, you know, uh, actual claiming happens by Kubernetes itself. So uh, we don't. We just try to leverage as much as much power of Kubernetes as possible, and you know, not to reinvent the wheel. That's a totally right approach. Another approach, which is technically possible in Jenkins and in the uh, Jenkins operator, there is a pluggable storage a set of stories. Maybe you have seen some of them. Uh, there is a link uh, on Jenkins. So, for example, there is pluggable storage available for artifacts for test results. And again, it's just a configuration uh, and the number of plugins installed. So you can use them along with uh, Jenkins operator. Uh, so for example, there is artifact manager for S3, which integrates with APIs and can even send data from agents without passing through the controller. Uh, so there are implementations like that. And uh, again, uh, they can be used in Jenkins operator, uh, but yeah. Mm. I wouldn't recommend that if you can use a Kubernetes native way. Yeah, it's probably important to mention that uh, we want to be portable. So we basically want to have uh, a Kubernetes as a requirement and uh, mm -hmm. we want to run on uh, different types of Kubernetes clusters. So we have to keep this in mind that, uh, well, other usages in mind also, yeah. <laughs> said. And yes, yeah, speaking of external storage, uh, from what I know, Jenkins operator includes external credential storage by default through Kubernetes secrets. Is it correct? Yes, uh, we are using Kubernetes secrets. Uh, mm -hmm. And Kubernetes secrets, and there is a plugin uh, that basically uh, ports uh, Kubernetes secrets into the uh, Jenkins uh, credentials. So yes. Thank you. So yeah, it's quite important part and uh, yeah, nice that it's uh, supported natively. I'll uh, post a link to this plugin later. Uh, so the next question, uh, is it possible to spin up uh, several Jenkins instances using different configurations of Jenkins? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I can answer this question. Uh, with uh, one operator only can uh, control and, uh, uh, and provision all, uh, one instance of Jenkins. However, you can spin up as many operators as you want. So uh, you can have multiple instances of Jenkins, but that means uh, multiple instances of the, uh, uh, of the operator itself, uh, which have an advantage that you, that you can use uh, 
you know, different namespaces for it and have uh, that level of isolation as well. So, uh, yeah, that, that I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, and it might be uh, something to consider for the future to support uh, more Jenkins instances per one operator. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what do we have uh, next? Um, so the next question um, is about, uh, you mentioned that the one Jenkins controller per team setup. Do you have any suggestion on how to manage common resources, mostly available licenses in our case, and lockable resource plugin uh, be used and synced across multiple Jenkins controllers? Mm. Well, I can actually provide the answer, but you may okay. not like it. So no, you cannot use lockable resources plugin in such a setup. So in CloudBC, we provide um, CloudBC, which is basically a multi-controller instance. And there you may have such issues with provision resource, but uh, there is actually native Kubernetes way for that. Uh, I've already mentioned the um, uh, uh, device plugins. And actually, device is actually something feasible, physical. And uh, for example, when I was working for my previous company, uh, I, there was no Kubernetes. We were actually using another platform, uh, Sun Retention. But the principle was the same. We were adding a unique resource device, in this case, license. And when you request an agent, for example, using Kubernetes uh, plugin, you can specify resources you want to get. Uh, one provisioning agent, and then you can uh, refer this license as a resource. And you will get a, a Kubernetes native way to manage uh, resources uh, because uh, yeah, it will be resource and Kubernetes will orchestrate access uh, between many Jenkins instances. So it's uh, the approach you could use um, basically, well, in any Kubernetes based setup, whether it's a Jenkins operator, classic Jenkins, called BCI, or whatever else, this approach will work because in this case, you will use a Kubernetes for resource uh, scheduling. And yeah, yeah, this is something really good for licenses because license quotas are really tough to manage. And yeah, if you want to know more about licenses and Kubernetes, I can do a separate uh, meetup presentation about that because yeah, I spent quite some time on handling this fun. Great answer, thank you. Yeah, and speaking of that, please submit feedback because if you want to know more about such topics, uh, submitting feedback form is the way to do that because then we know about the questions and create a backlog. Um, okay. Uh, so what else do we have? Um, yeah, any Kubernetes sharing uh, one workspace per job. So I guess support for shared workspaces and other things. Mateusz, would you like to answer this? Uh, I believe it is uh, possible to share workspaces. You can configure it uh, in your seed job definition. And if uh, that's not enough for you, uh, there are some uh, things that you can do uh, if, with configuration as code uh, to hopefully fit your needs. So that's up to you, but it's possible. Uh, yeah, also there is a plugin called External Workspace Manager. This plugin was created during Google Summer of Code 2016. Uh, the first part of it was to create APIs and to create an extension points. Uh, and we did that with examples as NFS. Um, and uh, other basically shared storages, uh, which is mapping to workspaces. Uh, but uh, and there was also um, a follow-up project to actually have native support for Kubernetes and for Docker. This project hasn't been implemented per se, but if someone is interested, we have all APIs, so small matter of programming, and you can have a Kubernetes native implementation for workspace sharing uh, with an agent. And I guess in this case, uh, there are also solutions based on uh, Kubernetes resources. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's technically possible. So for example, Picton does that. So it's, it should be possible to implement it in Jenkins as well in some way. Okay, 
yeah, I'll share the link to Workspace Manager. So feel free to try it out. But yeah, full disclaimer, it's not fully ready for Kubernetes use cases yet. Um, okay. And yeah, how will the research and the allocation of uh, pods happen? Uh, well, pods are provisioned uh, by using the Kubernetes plugin. Uh, so, well, first of all, you can define pod templates there. And then, for example, use labels uh, to decide which job should run where. Uh, and of course, you can uh, define a resource limits for those pods. So, yeah. And the actual allocation is handled by Kubernetes. Uh, it's scheduler. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two questions left. One uh, question is, uh, well, both questions are from Guillaume, so I guess it's a single question. So we can take it uh, to the next part of the presentation um, so that so we can just discuss it uh, um, just as informatively on the record. And if there are no questions uh, left, I would like to thank the speakers, thank Peter, Mateusz, uh, thanks Vahram uh, for co-hosting, and thanks to everyone who participated. We'll publish uh, the recording later. If you have any questions, again, uh, there is uh, operator chat. Uh, we'll share the link uh, along with the recording. You can join it and ask any questions. And if you are interested to stay offline, we will stop the recording and have uh, an open discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you.